You're on. All right, guys. Hey, how's everybody doing? I'm here with Jan again, and we are going to give you a little bit. Of, actually, Jan's going to give you the history lesson. But before we get started, we are able to do these videos by our sponsors at Core Belt. Steve, you work Core Belt. Tell those guys a little bit about it before we get talking about the history of the BAR. All right, guys. I actually have switched over to Core Belts myself. Uh, initially, we did a review video, and once there's probably five or six of us here in the store that have now switched over. Uh, so not only does it make this really cool clicky sound, but what's really neat is that those clicks are incremental adjustments that allow you to adjust. So as you can see, I'm wearing one here. If I need to let a little out during the day, I can. If I need to cinch it up just a little bit, I can do it that simple as well. It's really the only way to go. They're extremely durable. Uh, they can hold a lot of weight and quite frankly, one of the best belt systems I've come across. I didn't think I was actually going to switch when I started doing the review on it and I ended up getting hooked. I probably need to buy a tan one. I currently use a black one, but uh, check them out, Core Belts. We also have them in-house as well. So guys, check them out at coreessentials.com and Jan, let's talk a little bit about the BAR. Finally, we get to this. This is a viewer requested video. They wanted to know if anybody had the Bonnie and Clyde gun. We found one. Uh, this is, again, not necessarily the Bonnie and Clyde gun. This is a little bit later than that gun. So, well, let's start off with what would be the difference between a Bonnie and Clyde version and this version of the BAR. Well, there's three versions of BARs. The original BAR was 1918. Uh, the original one did not have a bipod. Uh, the handguard here went up over the barrel farther, didn't have the wings to guide the magazine in there. And the original ones were semi-auto and full auto. They were select fire. They fire from an open boat. Uh, the second one is an A1, which you never see. All the A1s were converted to this version, an A2, and the bipod would have mounted here. So is this, this is an A2? Two? Two, that's an A2. Okay. That's so, the last of the US BARs. Gotcha. Uh, this so, version come out right before World War II. So what year is this particular one that we're looking at right now? Uh, well, this is kind of a mishmash of parts. So it has parts from different eras. It has parts actually from World War One, World War Two, and Korea. Oh, sweet. <laughs> it's kind of a so there's it's a, a lot, mongrel. <laughs> right. There are a lot of cool features about the BAR. Now, what are some features right off the bat? Let's just start at the front and go and work our way to the rear. So the viewers, if you guys ever have any questions, don't forget you can ask questions about the BAR, and hopefully Jan will be able to help you out with that. Okay. The BARs are the thirty out six. I've heard guys say they were another calibers. If it was a US BAR, they are 30 out 6 and nothing else. What's BAR stand for? Uh, BAR stands for Browning Automatic Rifle. It's kind of unique how they were adopted. Uh, the head of ordnance before World War I, let's say he was pretty uh, not open to new views. Uh, he didn't want a, any demonstration of new guns in uh, March, April of 1917. Colt. Uh, got members of Congress and the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and they went out and they done a demonstration. They demonstrated two guns. One was the BAR, and the other one was a 1917 Browning. And uh, to get around the head of the Ordnance Department, they adopted the BAR spot after the first demonstration. Uh, the reason it's not designated the 1917, they adopted the water cooled as 19, and they didn't want two machine guns with the same designation. Got so it. they made these called in 1918. Uh, in World War One, they were about a year going into production, so they didn't see a lot of them, and they had some, but uh, the Army didn't want to take any of them to Europe in World War One. They didn't want the Germans to capture any of them and reverse engineer them. At the time it came out, it was a groundbreaking gun. It was uh, The original ones didn't have a bipod. They weighed about 14 pounds. So what would someone have done with this? Like, in service, what would the, the the goal of this rifle been in your infantry? Uh, at that time period, it was uh, basically used, like say, they didn't have a bipod. They used them as, they called it a machine rifle. They didn't call it a machine gun. Uh, you would use it much like you would use an M14 or an M16 today. They were selected fire. And you remember at time period, all the rifles were bolt action rifles, generally five shot magazines. These had 20 round magazines which was, you know, really in, innovative at that time so period. I, I guess my question would be, if you were in there and, and you were wanting to use the BAR, who, who would you have been? Like, would you, you have, have been, been the, support? Uh, you would have been like, uh, uh, well, you'd have been like a, like they would use a saw today. 
Okay. That would have been like your designation. You would have been uh, infantry support. Now, would they have carried these, like you see here, more of a... In the very first version, would, would have had a sling, and you would have been carrying that around, and it would have been a normal rifle for you. You would have just had this as a rifle. Then it turned into... A light machine gun. A light machine gun, where you would be more of a prone position laying down, you know, that type of thing. Well, they used them for suppressing fire. The original ones, their belt had a had a metal cup in here, and they would have fit the buttstock in the cup and shoot them from the hip. Actually, gotcha. gotcha. Uh, you see. Some, I think we've seen some videos of that before, yeah, where, where yeah. they're, they're shooting walking from the hip. fire. They called it, and the idea was they would shoot a full auto, and every time you put your foot down, it's supposed to shoot around as you advance to keep the heads down. Gotcha. Uh, it wasn't really successful, but it sounds good. Absolutely. So let's let's go at the front like we were doing. So we're talking. This is the version two, or what? What would you? Version two is that what you would call it? Actually, this? version three. Version three. So it has a bipod, it which is easy. Bi it folds up. Show show them kind of how this mechanism works on the front. Okay, the bipod. If you get this side here, you got a thumb screw here. Go ahead. Jim. And you just pull that down, then you slide it forward, and you lock up, fold the bipod up. Now, most of the troops in World War II in Korea, if they was going on patrol, they took actually took the bipods off to make them light. Sure. If they was in a fixed position in a trench or a foxhole, they put the bipod back on. Because uh, with the bipod, they weigh about 19 pounds, are relatively heavy. Is that, uh, is that what this one would weigh right now, about yeah, 19, 19 pounds? Yeah, 19 pounds. There. So we're looking next. We have front sight. It has a little shroud on the front. Yeah, it's a sight protector. Uh, it's basically is to protect the front sight for getting bent, bent up or beat up or knocked out of alignment. Um, a lot of the times they took that off uh, to make them lighter and threw it away. This one just happens to have one on it. Um, this here is a later version. This is your gas regulator. The first ones you had to drive out a split pin to change. There's uh, three orifices in there and the gun gets dirty. You can open up the gas for it and give them more gas You said pressure. it's a regulator, so it does it... It's it, actually got three different size orifices in there. It bleeds off the barrel, so you can... How much gas pressure goes on that gas piston in the end of here? It's a gas-operated gotcha. gun. So would that be something you would just, uh, I guess, change over time? Or, or would it say, okay, this isn't functioning the way I want it. I want to change a little bit more or less? Yeah, yeah if, usually you left them on the, slow, the, the smallest orifice. And if the gun got sluggish or didn't in there, they get dirty, they get sluggish, you would just actually turn this. And it'll turn to those three positions like that. And if it happens to stick, it has a big hole in it, you can stick the cartridge in the hole to turn it if it's out. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Pro, so. so that didn't come out till the Korean Korean War. That'd be Korean so the War first thing. version and the second version would not have that? Uh, no. Uh, they were they did have a three position orifice in there, but they had a split pin you had to push out and they were a lot harder to change. Gotcha. So a little bit farther back, you said on the first version this would have kind of been up a little farther. The handguard on the very first ones was longer this way and it come up actually up on both sides of the barrel so you wouldn't burn yourself. Sure. Uh, these barrels, that's one of the weaknesses of the BAR. They don't have a quick change barrel so uh, the barrels get really, really hot. Actually, if you look at this one, it's a little plum color in front of the chamber area. Sure. For, for a light machine gun, that's a fairly light barrel. What, with this it, a funny question is I see a lot when we have leaving our full auto rentals. I mean, people get, you know, the first thing they want to do is kind of like grab up here somewhere. It probably you learn real quick not to do you it. You only do it once. That's why I was <laughs> you say. You probably learn once. pretty quick, you know, do not do that. So we, we kind of go over a little bit like, hey, yeah. you don't want to put your hands here. But would that have been something that, that would have happened a lot? Or oh, would yeah. that have been just like, yeah, have you only do it one time? Yeah, you only do it one time. So I see. Takes, Basil, hey. come on this side real quick. So let's talk about this side. We have charging handle, but a little bit farther forward. It looks like you have a little lever. What's this little lever this for? This is here? the takedown lever that actually holds in uh, the gas tube here and the forearm when you take it down to clean it. This is on a dovetail here. You take this lever, turn it down, pull the pin out, and then that'll slide off. Okay, so this whole mechanism here would all slide come forward. Yeah. Gotcha. And there's another lever right here oh right here and okay. that one there would take the trigger group out for cleaning this one here this is your safety selector uh, a is automatic fire the r is repeat and so you don't accidentally put it on safety in the heat of battle it's got a little pin here put it on safety you have to push that in and then 
flip it on back and that would be safe. So like in the heat of battle, you you know, you take it off safe, it'd be on full auto. Now that does not pin it back. So when no. that comes down, the fact Yeah, it can't come back till you push it in. Okay, so it does actually keep it in yeah, there. Yeah, you cannot, yeah, you have to push this down and put it on safe. Okay, and, but what about to take it off safe? You just push it forward. You can just push it forward at that point. Off. Okay, gotcha. This is the mag release. Uh, the mag. That's different. So the mag release is inside the trigger. Yeah, you push it forward. The mag release. It's an empty mag. The gun's unloaded, but if they don't rock in. They go straight in. Lock in like this. So there's this. a little. Uh, take this back out here. I'll hit this button. All right. So as you can kind of see, there's a groove cut right yeah. in here where this fits perfectly. Yeah. And here's the notch where the mag catch holes. So you want to take a mag or drop the mag, you would actually take your finger and push forward on it, your trigger finger and push forward, drop the mag. Yep. So they, just like most of the full autos that we've discussed here recently, this would be shot from an open bolt. Again, you might open. tell them what that means by shot from an open bolt. Okay, well, right now it would be ready to fire. Um, so, so as you guys can see, there's nothing covering this. That is the chamber you're ready to go. Yeah, and I won't drop. Oh, watch your hand there. Got it, got it. And, when you pull the trigger, the bolt goes forward, strips around out of the magazine, and it goes all the way forward and fired the cartridge. On the recoil, look, give it, give it a pull down there. Yeah, yep. Give me pull back. Yeah, pull back. And now, see the bolt is locked. Locked. So it's actually on the it's, sear. It's locked right there, and then it's I on can the sear. Yeah, you I push can bring it. this forward. If you guys can't tell, this goes over the top actually of your grip so you'd bring it forward you'd lock it back to the front which yeah. locks in looks like over this little pin up here in the yeah. front and then that will, will allow you to shoot that first yeah, round the, from the, the open bolt the uh charging handle does not reciprocate with the bolt it doesn't yeah right move. right it doesn't move so and the reason we, these guns fire from an open bolt like I say this doesn't have quick change barrels and, and for cook off okay we talked about that yeah. last week but uh, so maybe for some people who haven't yeah cook off what, what do you mean by that exactly well, if you a uh, machine gun barrel, these barrels will literally get, if you fire one a lot, will get red. And you have a, if you have a loaded cartridge in the chamber, mm -hmm. the heat from the barrel will ignite the gunpowder and the gun will go off whether you pull the trigger or not. And that's called cook-off. That's the problem with the machine gun. So they use an open bolt so you didn't have a cartridge in the chamber. And two, so air can float through the barrel when you're not shooting. Sure. So let's talk about a little bit more up here in the front, Basil. All right. We have, we have looked down here. This is where the magazine is. You, you'll be able to go up here. This is the release for your mag. This is the selector from full auto to semi-auto and safe. Bolt, showing you how you guys, how they get that backwards. And let's talk about the sight. Now, this is not a sight that you would expect to have on a suppressive fire type gun, but it does have almost like a precision rifle type. Actually, the uh, sight in the leaf is the same sight and leaf that goes on the 1919 A4 okay. belt fed machine gun. That's the same sight. So, would this be a, a machine gun sight then? Is that it what is you would It is literally consider? a machine yeah. gun sight. Right. And uh, the, uh, well, we're going back. Uh, the original ones had wooden butt stocks and they had a tendency to crack. So in World War II, they come out with a uh, plastic fiberglass buttstock, which was supposed to be better. And if you look close, this one's cracked too. They, they weren't any better than the wood ones where they cracked. Uh, this thing flips up Let me scoot that down a little bit so you can talk to them. This flips up here, and you hook that over the top of your shoulder when you're shooting at full auto. It won't slide down your shoulder and go under. So would I have been laying more prone? You would have been prone. You prone generally shot these prone. So shot it prone, I would have this over my shoulder. It'd be sitting on top so I could kind of be freehand to move a couple things. And plus, it'd be a little bit more stable on my shoulder. Yeah, and if we look here on the bottom here, you see this notch cut out I here. didn't even notice that notch. And there's a hole in here, and they was a uh, monopod, an adjustable monopod that you would slip in this hole. Okay. It would give you a rear support on the butt stall. So people who don't know what that is, so that would give you an adjustment so it could actually adjust from just laying on the ground, but also adjust up and down like this. Uh, the thing about the monopod is they're very, very rare. 99% of the time you throw them away. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't want to carry that thing and pitch it away. Yeah. yeah. So, sling-wise, this is what you would expect. This mount would be something that is on normal ones. I mean, this would be a, an actual military-issued weapon would have this mount. Yes. Some do and some don't. The early ones didn't. That come with the early A2s. 
And later in the Korean so, and, versions, and they didn't put it in. I've been saying version, but there's an A1, an A2, and an A3. Or, okay. No, there's not an A3. It, there's just an A18, A1. 1918, an A1, and an A2. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this version that we have here in front of us, what year would this be from? Uh, most of this one would be Korean War. Uh, if you look on here, on the trigger group, I can't remember which side it is. Yeah. If you look over here, see there? Mm -hmm. the, in the square box. That's Royal Typewriter. <laughs> R-O-T. That's Royal Typewriter. Royal Typewriter made BARs during the Korean War. Gotcha. And like a typewriter the, company. The typewriter company. In World War II, IBM made them. Now, I, I've heard this before with carbines and stuff like that. Well, that IBM, even International Harvester, all these guys yeah. were making different um, um, 30 carbines. Well, BARs the same, but the World War I BARs were made by Cold and Winchester. Okay. The World War II BARs were made by IBM and NISA. And NISA is... Uh, NISA? I've never heard of NISA. Uh, actually, it's the first letter of a bunch of different manufacturers who went together. They were small manufacturers, and you made this part, and you made that. So uh, the World War II ones, a lot of them were made by what's called NISA. Uh, they needed more in Korea and Royal Typewriter made them. Now this one particular gun here, if you look up here, you'll see the flaming bomb and a barrel date right behind the, uh, right behind the rear sight, right up here. And you'll see an HS, and that's a high standard replacement barrel. Oh, <laughs> the, high standard. And the date will be 1954. That's a 1954 dated high standard replacement barrel. Those BARs went through barrels. Pretty no, cool, I'm sure. Pretty quick. What, what would the, and you might not even know the, the answer on this, but what would a life expectancy be out of a barrel? Uh, generally, uh, they expected, uh, depending on the use, if they were careful with them, they'd last 15, 20,000 rounds. Still, that's pretty good, I would say. If you weren't careful with it and you melted them down, you could burn one up in 400 rounds. <laughs> now, when you say not careful, could I not shoot in more time 400 rounds out of this? You one wouldn't want another? You would not want to shoot 400. If you shot 400 rounds of continuous out of there, mag after mag after mag, the barrel, you would ruin the barrel. It would. It would instantly uh, literally ruin it. You'd melt the barrel. Base. Okay. So mm -hmm. let, let's talk at the, our favorite part. Let's talk about price. If I was to buy a magazine, what would I expect to pay for? You know, I haven't seen BAR mag sell for a while. Uh, I expect probably $25, $30. Or okay. not that it, they made millions of them. Sure. Uh, they don't fit anything but a BAR, so they're not much for anything. Right, yeah, who, who would want them unless you had right. a BAR? They have a BAR. Um, so they're not particularly hard to find. An early, an early full auto BAR, what would somebody expect to pay for? Uh, 1918 Cold or Winchester, 40,000 plus. And then, let's say, a A1 or an A2? Uh, an A1, uh, I have no idea. There's so few of them around. That would be whatever a buyer would be willing to pay. The A2 U.S. guns. What, why is A1 rare? Because they converted all the A1s to A2. <laughs> oh, gotcha, okay. And a lot of the 1918s were converted to A2. If they had a 1918... So the first two versions, or the first two groups, probably would have already been converted at this time if they were in military yeah, circulation. Right. If they'd have been in military hands, they'd have been converted to A2. And just to recap, because even I, I can't keep it all in my head, what would make it an A2? Like I say, the bipod <laughs> would have been attached here and <coughs> sorry it would have been attached right here on the on the gas block instead of on the end and that would have been one descriptor saying this would make it an a1 make it an a1 this would be an a2 right okay and uh, the gas and the system, site was the this gas would have been the same the, the the cylinder would be the gas regulator would have been different it would have been the earlier gas so regulator. this is the only if you see this, you will know that it is an A2. It'd be a Korean War vintage A2, because the A2s in World War II had the earlier gas regulator. Okay. That's actually come out of Korea. So if you were looking at a, a, a A2 like this, what could somebody expect to pay? Uh, probably, they'd start probably 25 to 30. So you're, you're bumping 10 grand to be able to get that, that first version that would be a full term. Yeah, okay. right. So that's kind of like the holy grail of BARs. Right. Actually, the rarest BAR is what they call a Colt monitor. And Colt came out of them in the 1930s. They had no bipod, but they had a muzzle brake and compensator. 
and they only made like 120 cents. Oh, well, yeah. And I mean, the FBI bought 90 cents. <laughs> <laughs> so they're in a vault somewhere. All right, rate of fire, What's what would people expect? Uh, on the high rate of fire, on an A2 would have been 550 to 600, the low rate of fire would have been 400 to 450. Of course, the semi-auto, the selective fires would have been, you know, 550 to 600 again, <laughs> sure. and then semi-auto. Um, now, you were talking to me a little bit off camera about something that, that um, can be modified on these some way to, to, to slow down that cycle rate. Yeah, the, well, on the A2s, they put a rate reducer. When they made them, they took away the semi-auto. This, uh, the selector would, would have been, uh, or this one would be marked auto for repeat, I mean, the R for repeat. That would be the slow rate of fire. And what they've done is they changed the mechanism in the trigger group and they put a rate reducer in the butt stop to make a slow rate of fire. What's a rate reducer? Uh, in this case, it's a big long spring with a piston in there. When you fire it, the bolt comes back. It, it's doesn't, the it doesn't let it go and cycle as fast moving right. forward. It's, it, it holds the sear until the sponger goes back down the butt stop and back in and trips the sear. It slows it down. Basil? At the very end here, I, anything else you want to add and yes. talk about with people? Yeah, I will. Uh, all the move, move motion pictures and everything, they show uh, Bonnie and Clyde with Thompson submachine gun. As far as anybody knows, Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker never ever had a Thompson machine gun. They used BARs. Right. And they generally, I think when they were apprehended, let's say, uh, one of them they had was stolen from the police department and the other two were stolen from National Guard Armory. But they liked the BAR when they were in a chase, somebody would break out the window in the car they were shooting, and they'd unload a mag in the uh, radiator and the engine block of the police car, chased them, and that was the end of the chase. Right. And uh, the other thing is, these guns are actually very low, low recoil, they're very pleasant to shoot. Bonnie Parker was about five, or about four foot ten. Yeah, I knew 80, she was small. She was about four ten and weighed like eighty some pounds, and. Uh, they said she was really, really good with one. I mean, they were thugs and criminals, sure. but Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker, they practiced and they were actually quite good with the ARs. That's one reason that they was in so many shootouts that they got away. They were better armed than the police. That's right. <laughs> and, and at that time, I don't think a lot of the police departments would even have the resources to be able to get something like this until they requested it, I'm sure, or had to get it from a, the FBI or something else Somebody that would else. be able to give it to them. Yeah. Um, now, that's now we, this is a U.S. BAR. Now, between World War One and World War Two, other countries also adopted the BAR. Uh, the Swedes adopted the BAR. Theirs had a pistol grip down here. Oh, really? And Why would they have had a pistol grip? What, they, what would have been the, the... They just wanted a pistol grip. I was going to say, I don't, I don't know what that purpose would have been other than... You Probably know, why, oh, why does it? Why does an AR-15 have a pistol grip sure, and a sure, carbine? Sure, sure. you know. yeah. But uh, Poland used BARs also. Uh, the Poles used BARs. FN made BARs for Belgium and sold them to other people. And the very last BARs that uh, Belgium made had quick change barrels. They had a quick change barrel. Now, so how would that have been quick change? Uh, they had a latch on it. Uh, Same thing like with the one we looked yeah, at last yeah, week. Yeah, uh, similar was, to that. What was the gun we looked at last week? I am terrible. ZV 26. ZV 26. Where, uh, 26. Yeah. All right, so it just had like a little flip down almost, yeah, a handle, yeah. and it just slipped out. Yeah. So that's what it would have kind of been like on that? Yeah, that had been like that. And the interesting It'd thing... It makes more sense. Of it. Well, the interesting thing is, is this gun still lives. Because the uh, M240 machine gun we use today, all the M240 is is a BAR action turned upside down with a German MG42 belt feed. That's all an M240 is. The bolt lock up, the operating system is a BAR. Really? Yes. <laughs> Thought of it that way. But we can do that sometime. We can actually bring that in. Uh, it's, it's, you know, anybody's got an M240. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can figure that out. <laughs> But um, what else do you want to talk about? Is there anything that, that um, over the years people have ever asked you about a BAR that you were just a little tip, a little knowledge before we get out of here? No, not really. All I can say is, is the BAR was the darling of the Marine Corps. I've never talked to a Marine who didn't use a BAR that, yeah. that weren't in all. They all loved them. And when, would have, when would have been the last issue of the BAR? Fifty cent by you some in Vietnam. It did. Now, what would they have used to replace it in Vietnam? The M60. Okay. All right. Because 
I remember, and I can't remember what it was, some sort of footage that looked like a BAR almost during the Vietnam no era. Well, they, had, they used BARs in yeah. Vietnam. And they weren't very many of them. Uh, they were highly prized, I've been led to believe, in Vietnam. Like, like people wanted them. People wanted in, them. Instead of the one they currently had. Well, the one during the Vietnam, they didn't have, per se, a light machine gun. You either had the M16 or the M60 or an M16 or an M14, depending on you know, sure. when you were over there. But the M60 would have been the light machine gun, heavy machine gun, both. It replaced this and the brownies, both. So guys, if there are any questions that you want us to answer, we'll gladly get to those. Uh, this is about, what, a minute, maybe, a minute or two, we'll answer some questions. Uh, in, in closing... Um, oh, one more thing. Okay. One more thing. I will throw this out. Uh, if you want a BAR, Okay. Uh, there's a company in Ohio. It's called Auto uh, Ohio Ordnance. I, I've heard of them actually. Ohio Ordnance, and they make a semi-auto version of these. They look exactly like this, only they're not. Uh, they fire from a closed bolt because the ATF says they have to. Hmm. And I wonder they, why that make a difference. Because uh, it's too easy to convert an open bolt gun to a machine gun. Got it. Uh, they fire from a closed bolt. They look just like this. So, as a matter of fact, most of the parts will interchange except for the trigger mechanism. And Obviously, because they don't want it to interchange. Yeah, they're, right? yeah, they're not interchangeable. Magazines are the same. Uh, uh, could you take the guts out of this gun and put it in that gun at all? No, nothing will interchange. Nothing will interchange like that. Nothing will interchange. None, none of the fire wise. control parts okay. will interchange. Because I could see guys that have um, an older rifle like this that they were like, I want to go blow it up. I'm going to blow up the cheap one. You know what I'm trying to say? These are pretty much indestructible. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and if you take care of them. If you're yeah. not just treating them bad, it'll last anybody a lifetime. Well, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, and one thing about when they make the semi-auto ones now, uh, you can find barrels for them. Because they're making new barrels for the oh, semi-auto yeah. ones and the barrels that. Yeah. change. That makes sense. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that is a little tidbit of history about the Browning BAR. Yeah, again, we are finding guys that have this type of stuff out there, so we, we'll kind of get some connections. Hopefully, we'll be able to bring you guys more full auto fun on Thursdays, some history lessons. Um, Jan, again, it, we, we can't thank you enough for coming in and helping us out. If there is a video that you guys want us to talk about, please let us know. We'll try to do it live again next Thursday, hopefully whenever, no, not next Thursday. Is next Thursday Christmas? Yeah. Not next no, Thursday. No, next Thursday, a day after Christmas. Okay, and I won't Christmas. be here. But we will get to a video here. Maybe Steve will be able to do it with Jan next week about a different gun. We don't know what that gun's going to be yet, but definitely come back, check us out next Thursday, same time, Alex, Jan, and thank you to Corbells for sponsoring we the video. We did have one question come in. Go ahead. Uh, someone asked if in Vietnam, were the BARs converted to 7.62 or 308? No, all US BARs were thir BARs were 30 out 6. Yeah. Every one of them. Now, the foreign guns, the Polish guns were 8 millimeter. Some of the FN guns were 8 millimeter. And I'm not sure what the Swedish caliber was. I don't it know. It would have never been 308 or 7.62. No, they was never in 308. They were all 30 out 6. All right. Again, guys, thank you so much for.